We begin our coverage in Japan this morning with CBS News correspondent Harry Smith, who joins us on the phone this morning from Sendai. Harry, good morning. And that's partially because you need to stay inside at this point. Well, they're, uh, they're, they're, it's a little bit vague, to be perfectly honest. They would prefer that we uh, stay inside. We were outside all day, and there were plenty of rescue operations and a lot of actual normal citizens going about their business uh, today in Sendai. And we're several hours north of uh, Fukushima, where the uh, crippled nuclear reactor is. And it looks like the Japanese are uh, losing their battle to get control of that place. As we say, that's Fukushima, which is a couple of hours south of where we are, well, there was even more bad news today. Fears of a nuclear disaster grew today following a third explosion and fire, the largest so far, at the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. The uh, reading of the level seems very high. And there is still a very high risk of further radioactive material. Workers were struggling to prevent meltdowns of three reactors at the site when the fourth reactor blew. The fire that followed is believed to be the source of the elevated radiation. Some 70,000 people had been evacuated from a 12-mile area after the initial explosions. Now a new warning has been issued to another 140,000 people living near the plant. We would like to ask you to remain indoors and avoid going outside. As many as 800 workers at the site were also evacuated. Elevated levels of radiation have already reached Tokyo. At this time, officials say they don't pose a health risk. Japan's nuclear crisis now appears to be worse than 1979's Three Mile Island accident, but not yet as bad as the Chernobyl disaster in Ukraine in 1986. In the midst of the crisis, Prime Minister Khan made an appeal to an anxious nation. And I would like to ask the nation, although this is an incident of great concern, but I request that you act very calmly. As this crisis enters its fifth day, the numbers of those who lost their lives continues to grow. Now more than 2,700. Up the coast in the tsunami zone, we looked around the town of Ishumanaki. Walking on the railroad tracks is the driest way to get around. And while most of the floodwaters have finally subsided downtown, closer to the ocean, there was devastation in every direction. In town after town along the northeast coast, the scenes are similar, if not the same. Wherever the tsunami came, wherever the water reached, it destroyed everything in its path. It's downright apocalyptic. This man owned a seafood processing plant on the waterfront. It's gone. He's not seen or heard from his son since Friday. Your youngest son is missing. Is missing. Missing. You, you him missing. missing. I believe he's my son, so he's he must be surviving. DNA, my DNA. Your DNA. Right. Okay. So you think he survived? Yep. We hope his optimism is not in vain. Here in Sendai today, there were long lines for gas and groceries. Ninety minutes wait. Ninety minute waits for gasoline. And quite honestly, the Japanese have been handling all of this with. Uh, incredible grace. Erica? Yeah, that, that seems to be definitely one of the headlines we, we should emphasize there is how well they're handling this. There's a lot of focus today, Harry, on the weather in the area and how that could impact uh, the nuclear plants there. What's the latest? Yeah, the weather is, uh, frankly, especially up here in Sendai, kind of crappy, but uh, it has been to the advantage of, of all who uh, live along the coast because the pri uh, uh, primary winds uh, have been from the, uh, from the west. And so that uh, has been blowing the nuclear material, material out to sea. And uh, that's the way the weather looks, uh, at least for the uh, foreseeable future. So there is some good news there. All right, Harry Smith in Sendai this morning. Harry, thanks.